Hi, this is Miss Litton, and we are doing our H Bio Chapter Six review about three days early. And this small group, an excellent group, is showing up. Very proud of you. You are on my candy list. Um, so remember, the first thing we talked about in this is energy. Okay, and we talked about the different kinds of energy, like kinetic energy is energy of motion. Chemical energy could be stored or potential energy like in food. Um, we talked about the first law of thermodynamics. Say that with me. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can just be transformed. Yeah, be transformed and transferred. And then the second law says every time you convert that energy or transform that energy, you lose some as heat. Perfect. Okay, we then introduce the idea of entropy. And entropy is the amount of what? Disorder. Disorder. And the reason why we need ATP, which is why the reason why we need food and oxygen, um, is so that we can try to fight against disorder. Okay, we're trying to fight against entropy. And when you have great entropy, high entropy, high disorder, there's less potential energy in that. Okay, having low entropy is having um, greater potential energy. And we talked about a solid versus a liquid. More potential energy, less potential energy. And then we leveled it up to actual biochem. When you have a molecule of glucose that is more organized, C6H12O6, and all those multiple bonds within that sugar mo molecule are storing energy that has more potential than the disorganized, higher entropy CO2 molecule, okay? So more, more free energy here, okay? More, more free energy here, when we looked at G, remember, and then we looked at delta G, okay. More free energy here with glucose, less here. This one is higher in entropy, this is lower in entropy. Now, at the very end of the unit, I started talking to you about putting everything together and talking about membranes. And we talked about in this situation, this is low entropy here on the left, high entropy here on the right. This one on the left has more potential energy because on this side, you have more hydrogen ions. So there is a difference in concentration. Okay, I don't know why that's there, but yes, we want to continue. Continue. That's really difficult. Um, okay. Um, am I still recording? Yes. We have a difference in concentration, and then because these are hydrogen ions, we also have a difference in charge, and we have a difference in pH because this side would have a lower a lower pH than this side. That's a lot of potential. It's a lot of potential energy because it's like putting water behind a dam. You have so many hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane, they want to move to the Outside. other side. And if you make this like an enzyme, let's say this enzyme's name right there is ATP synthase complex. Let's just say random enzyme, <laughs> okay? The hydrogen ions are gonna to wanna to move through it, and when they go through it, you could maybe take a DP and have the energy to make a, what? TP, which is like the energy currency of the cell. That's why I explained all of that, is to get you to that point so you understand when that occurs in both cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So, Concentrate hydrogen ions on one side. When they go back through, it's like it turns. They're like spinning. Like when you go to Disneyland and you go through the thing and you really want to get inside Disneyland, so you'll walk through that and turn it. That will help you um, snap on a phosphate onto ADP to make it ATP. All right. Ask the person next to you anything confusing, any clarifying questions you need right now. Anything confusing? Okay, is there anything you want to ask? I am right now? I'm not TikToking or YouTubing. <laughs> okay, all right. I still have to write all my lesson plans. That's kind of where I'm at. Okay, all right. Um, 
So, um, anything you want me to clear up on that? Yes. Okay, so this happens in my car. Yeah, I haven't taught you that yet, but I'm preparing your brain to be able to absorb it better by having you just accept the idea that if you have more hydrogen ions on one side of a membrane than another side, that you can use that to do work. Okay. Just like if I had water behind a dam, I could use that difference, yes, to do work to turn a turbine to make electricity. Okay. We're gonna use this to turn a turbine to make ATP. That's nice. Okay, all right, and we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that in mitochondria and we're gonna do it in chloroplast as well. I'm just kind of pre-teaching that so it makes it easier to learn it when we get to those two chapters. All right, so then next we talked about your metabolism. Your metabolism is all the enzyme-mediated reactions that occur in your body. So we can control which reactions go forward by controlling the enzyme. Those reactions that are building synthetic reactions we call anabolic reactions. Those reactions that are about breaking we call catabolic. The way I remember that is a cat running around breaking things in your house. Okay, And in this diagram, we can see this large molecule becoming several smaller molecules. So is that, oh, it's already identified. So that would be an example of catabolism. This one here on the bottom, smaller molecules becoming a larger molecule, that's an example of anabolism. Here's the deal. Remember we already learned this about potential energy, right? There's energy in all the multiple bonds that are holding these molecules together. And when we break those bonds, we can release what? Energy. So the energy from the catabolic reaction can be used to do the anabolic reaction. And we call that what? Coupled reactions. Coupled reactions. Because you do them together, right? Because it's helpful that way because you can provide the energy that the anabolic reaction needs from the catabolic reaction. Questions? Concerns? Yes. Wait, this is, I'm just wondering, technically, which happens first? It can happen simultaneously. Like, just like? Well, because it's probably not just one reaction. There's probably several reactions taking place. And so it, it, they're probably going to be happening in conjunction, very similar. Okay. So not just in conjunction. Yeah. It could be, though. Um, and then we just need to review things like reactants and products. So reactants are what you start out with. Products are what you end up with. Okay, and once we understand that, we can talk about delta G. Did this reaction release energy or does this reaction require energy? So something like this, when you're measuring free energy, your energy, this was your starting point, this would be where your reactants are, this is your ending point, your products. So who had more energy, the reactants or the products? The reactants had more energy. They were, had more potential energy, this ball being at the top of the hill, and then it rolls down to the bottom of the hill. It has less energy, right? It doesn't have anywhere to roll. So the reactant had more energy. Now I have less energy. So if I change, it's like here I had more money. Now I have less money. My delta G, my delta money is negative. I have spent it. It rolled down the hill. Whereas this, I have a savings account. I had less money, now I have more, more money in my products. So I'm putting energy into this system. So my delta G is a positive reaction. And the big idea would be that, did the Instagram post, oh, you had clearance, I bet. Did you have clearance? Yeah. I wonder where all you guys were. So in this case, my um, delta G, the energy I lost here, could be used for the energy I need down here. What do you call that? The energy I lost here, the energy I lost here could be used in this reaction that I need energy. What, what do you call it? Reactions. Coupled reactions, exactly. Okay, this is gonna give off energy, this one needs energy, coupled reactions. The hill is how much energy you have available to do work. Isn't your exosome, like if the exosome, if you're making the energy and that energy. You're releasing it. Yeah. Oh, and the yeah. released energy can be used, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? 
So I'm releasing something that can be used to do build something. Just like I could hand somebody some money and then they could build me a cheeseburger. Right? Okay. Now, um, ATP is our energy currency. Those are our dollar bills. It is adenosine triphosphate. And the way the energy works is that the third phosphate, so that's adenine, ribose, phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. So it's an example of a nucleic acid. It is, in fact, ATP is a nucleotide with two bonus phosphates on it. If you snap those bonus phosphates off, you will get what in return? Energy. Okay? So that's why they say it's the energy currency. You can store some ATP, and then when you need energy, break a phosphate, release that energy, so you can build whatever thing you need to build or light something up or move some muscle or move your cytoskeleton, whatever it is you need to do, okay? Um, we then talked about, this part was how when you need to build something in your body like muscle or you need to build a hormone or some other protein, that's gonna cost you ATP. So this adenosine triphosphate is snapping off a phosphate and then when you do that, then you will have energy released and that energy that was in the ATP is now going to be used to build a more complex molecule once you have a more complex molecule like a bagel you can break that down through catabolic reactions and use that energy to build ATP so this is cyclical right this is why we constantly eat food so we can break down the food molecules and use that energy in the bonds to make ATP. Then once I have the energy currency that works, right, then I can use that ATP and spend it however I need to in my cell. I can't spend a donut, okay? I can throw a donut at my body, it's not gonna be able to do anything. I need to change that chemical energy, that potential energy, into the energy that actually spends here. What kind of money do you have to have to spend here in the United States? Dollars. Dollars. So if you come to me with rubles, right? Apparently, Kansas said <laughs> whatever. Okay, if you come to me with rubles, that's not gonna work on our Coke machine. It's still potential energy, right? It's still rubles, but I need to go to a bank to change it into an energy currency that works here in the United States. Donuts are potential energy. Not the best potential energy, but they are. I need to change this into a different chemical energy, and that's ATP. So I will break the donut apart in multiple steps through cellular respiration, harvest the energy to build ATP. Then I can use the ATP for whatever else I need to do in my body. What are the kinds of things I need to do in my body? Chemical work, transport work, and mechanical work. So chemical work would be like building something, muscle or building this protein that glows. Transport work, we talked about there's active and passive transport. Active, pa active transport requires energy okay and active transport transport might be like a sodium potassium pump or it might be this what's this endo and exocytosis exactly and then um, mechanical work I might need to move a cytoskeleton or I might need to move some flagella some actin and myosin in a muscle in order to cause movement so that would be an example of mechanical work okay ask your Review, buddy, that you're sitting next to. Is there anything you need help with right now on any of that? It's all so high. Okay. This material, you're very fierce. You've got it. You're spectacular. Questions? Okay, let's move on. Metabolism. Remember, your metabolism is all your enzyme-mediated reactions. You have a lot of reactions that occur in your body. So... Um, how does that work? Well, to turn a reaction on, you could have a catalyst. And that catalyst could bind to a substrate and change it. It could either be building something or breaking something apart. An organic catalyst is called an enzyme. Enzymes have a very specific area on them that is called their active site. Okay, and that active site, let me clone you. It's right here, right? That active site 
is where the substrate is going to bind. And in order, in this case, would this reaction be catabolic or anabolic? Catabolic. Catabolic, exactly. Now, if something landed right here and blocked it on the active site and it bound right there so that the substrate could not bind there, what would we call that? Competitive. Competitive inhibition, right? Because then the substrate would not be able to fit into its spot. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. It could be because we don't need any more of that product. So we need a way to switch it off. Or you could have something bind at a different location on the enzyme, but it ends up still changing the active site in some way. So it's not actually binding to the active site, but it changes the shape of the active site. What do we call that? Non-competitive. Non and if this right here that bound to it was a product of this reaction that's been going on, going on, going on, that's an example of feedback. I have enough product, so let me shut off this enzyme because I don't need it anymore. Okay? What do you call this site where this non-competitive inhibitor binds? Starts with an A. Allosteric. 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 Okay. And it changes that shape. Now, we also mentioned that, in, that an enzyme can change its shape temporarily um, when it's binding to that substrate. Okay. Um, and that may be a, a, a normal part of its functioning. Okay. This slight change in shape. We talked about that you only need a little bit of enzyme because once it's done, it can catalyze another reaction and another reaction. It's not changed by the process. So it can keep facilitating multiple and amplify the results of whatever it is you're trying to get because it is not changed by that reaction in any way. We said that enzymes are often named for their substrate. So lactase would digest lactose, exactly, okay? Um, and then we started to talk about, even in exergonic reactions, even when your delta G overall is a negative delta G, here's my reactant, here's my product. It's hard for me to get there to my product because I have this hurdle. And what's this hurdle right here called? Energy of activation. Energy of activation. And what enzymes can do is lower the hurdle. So kinetic energy is enough to facilitate that reaction and then that reaction can take off. We talked about this due to the fires. We said there's so much kindling right out here, all the weeds and dry brush from all the rains that we had and then it all dried out and died. There's a lot of potential energy in that. In fact, when I walk around, that's all I can see is like, hmm, so much kindling, okay? But it doesn't spontaneously catch fire, right? Because of the complexity of it, what does it need? It needs a match, something. But once it does that, once the match is there, it lowers the hurdle, and then boom, it takes off, right? And so that's what we talked about what enzymes do. That hurdle is just, even though it's exergonic, here's your starting point, here's your starting point, here's your starting point right here, here is your ending point, okay? So the ending point is lower, right? It's going down. It is an exergonic reaction. But this hurdle, uh, pounds, okay. This hurdle is so great, this energy of activation, that reaction doesn't occur, even though it's completely exergonic. But what an enzyme will do with an enzyme is it lowers that hurdle and it makes that reaction more likely to go forward. Okay. And then we said, okay, what kind of things can affect an enzyme? Well, you can increase the substrate, increase what you're starting with, your reactant, you'll get more product up to a point until all the active sites are filled. We said temperature can influence an enzyme's activity because it has to be in the right shape. Same thing, pH can influence an enzyme's activity because it has to be in the right shape. Because you need the active site to be exactly a certain configuration and temperature and pH can make the molecules rearrange themselves and alter that configuration. Um, we talked about needing cofactors like vitamins to help the enzyme be in the right shape. 
We also talked what can regulate enzyme activity is, we already talked about this, a competitive inhibitor, which competes for the active site, or a non-competitive inhibitor that binds in the allosteric site, but ultimately still changes the active site. That can help regulate enzyme activity as well. And then we talked about substrate, uh, or sorry, we talked about um, feedback inhibition, where your product ends up changing one of the enzymes in your metabolic pathway, so it kind of switches it off. So if enzyme one is out of the picture, it doesn't even matter. You don't even have to regulate enzyme two, three, four, five, and six, because you took care of the first step, right? It's like if you needed to go through, like in a motel room or hive, they have all those interconnecting doors. If you needed to get to the other side of the hotel room, if the first door is locked, it's never gonna happen. You don't even have to worry about locking the other doors. You can't get through the first door. So if this enzyme this active site is changed, that's the only one you have to spend time controlling. You don't have to go and lock all the other ones, right? In your house, you only lock the front door. You don't lock all the rooms in your house, right? Because if you control the front door, then you control the house. You know what I mean, there's back doors, I get it. Okay, then, and this, and this was a big, big chapter because it's all about energy and enzymes. So it's kind of like, how do we control the process, all these metabolic processes? One of the things we discussed is the transfer of energy. This would be the second law of thermodynamics, right? Energy is not created nor destroyed, it's just transferred. Transfer. How can you transfer it? Basically by handing off electrons. And if you give some, some molecule its electrons, you're in fact giving them some, energy. you're giving them a charge, but you're giving them energy, right? Mm -hmm. And electrons have what charge? Negative. Negative. So that's why they say, oh, you got reduced. But energetically, you have more energy. You're just reduced in charge, right? So if you want a lot of energy, you'd be like, reduce me, reduce me, reduce me. Because that means you're getting more of those negative electrons, which means you have more energy. Conversely, if you get oxidized, you're losing energy. Why did they pick oxygen or oxidized for that? Because oxygen is very electronegative, and it tends to steal electrons because it wants them very badly. So when an object gets oxidized, oxidized, so A got oxidized, it lost electrons. How could it lose electrons? Well, it could lose electrons because it hooked up with oxygen, and oxygen takes, you know, because it wants electrons so badly, it'll take them from, from you. Or it could break up with hydrogen. If it was with hydrogen here, and then it lost the hydrogen because it gave it to B, it would also get oxidized, two different ways. Either because you break up with the giver or you hook up with the taker. Either way, you lose those electrons. Conversely, when you get um, reduced, you either hook up with a giver because he will give you more energy or you break up with a taker. Either way, you'll have more energy, right? Okay, so we talked that um, when um, you do cellular respiration and photosynthesis, you're gonna take, um, in, well, let me start with aerobic respiration. You're gonna take the energy, the electrons that are in glucose, and you're ultimately gonna pull the energy out of those in order to make ATP. You are going to take this glucose and you're gonna oxidize it. And remember, oxidize, means that you're getting the energy out of it, right? You're gonna oxidize it down into CO2. Remember, CO2 would be higher entropy, less potential energy. But whenever you oxidize something, you have to reduce something else. So who do we reduce? Water. Yeah, the oxygen gets reduced into water. Now, what got oxidized? More energy was released than got reduced. So the leftover is right here, and we're gonna use that to make ATP. So overall, it's an exergonic reaction. And it's the reverse of that in photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, we take energy from the sun, and we use that energy to reduce CO2 into glucose. But again, if something's gonna get reduced, then something else has to get Oxidized. So who gets oxidized? The water into oxygen. This gets oxidized. And these hydrogens right here 
become these hydrogens right here. Okay, and when we do cellular respiration, okay, this glucose is getting oxidized into CO2, and the oxygen is getting reduced, okay, into water. And again, these hydrogens right here end up being these hydrogens right here. It's just a transfer of hydrogens. Where does cellular respiration take place? Mitochondria. And it's overall an exergonic reaction, so that's why ATP, when we do cellular respiration, okay, ATP is on the product side, it's exergonic. When we do photosynthesis, um, the sun is on the reactant side, it's an endergonic reaction. Okay, ask the person next to you, how are you feeling about that? Okay, um, there will be a series of electron transfer transfers that takes place. The electron transfers occur in what's really good name, electron transport chain. <laughs> and it's in membranes that we'll be learning about in mitochondria and chloroplasts. And ultimately what we do with those electron transfers is used to build a hydrogen ion gradient so we can make ATP in both of those. I don't know if we did this last one. Do you want to do any questions? No. no. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Are vitamins enzymes? No. They are um, coenzymes. They're not the enzyme, but they are there. Why don't you go in as whatever you were for, um, oh, yeah. for Halloween? I was about to say Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'm going to pause you just for a minute while they get logged in. Okay, and here are the questions. I'm going to just show them real quick. Again, just pause it if you need to answer this question so you can commit, commit your answer. Oh, did I only ask one question here? Okay, hurry up and finish. All right, let's check. Okay, let's go back and do another one. We're working backwards. Maybe no. We're working backwards. Ooh, let's do this one real quick. This is a good review for your quiz. The dragon. Okay. So gaining hydrogen. Think about it. Losing energy. What is it? Do this one with me. Um, Losing energy. Reduced. Is it reduced? Oxidized. No. Losing energy is what? Oxidized. Oxidized. Gaining energy is? Reduced. reduced. Gaining electrons? Would be oxidized. No. Losing electrons? Reduced. Losing electrons would be oxidized. Lose oxygen? Reduce, because oxygen's a taker. So gain oxygen is oxidized, hence the name. And lose hydrogen? Oxidized. Oxidized. Yes, I do, actually. Let's see. Let me do this. Show the questions so you can practice at home. There are four questions here, so commit to your answer. Okay. 
Commit to your answer so you can practice this. Here's question two. Pause it if you need to. This is a map. It means multiple answers possible. It's not a man. Multiple answers needed. You don't know. It's just possible. Here's question three. Let's see if I'll make this bigger for you. And I can't. I don't think Sparkle Pen works on this. Oh, it does. There it is. I Sparkle Pinned it for you. There's your picture. Now look at your question. And here is question number four. You guys ready? Here we go. The active site of a specific enzyme is part of the enzyme where the substrate can fit and can be used over and over again. It is not similar to any other enzyme. Then you would only have one enzyme. <laughs> All enzymes would be the same and you would have no control. All right? It is affected by environmental factors such as pH and temperature. Number two, if you want to increase the amount of product per unit time of an enzymatic reaction, it says do not do this. So if you don't want it to work, if you don't want it to work, change the pH. Because remember, every change in pH is really what? Tenfold. If you increase the temperature somewhat, will the reaction work? Yeah. Yes. How about the enzyme? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How about the amount of substrate? Yes. Yeah. The thing that will impact it really rapidly is small changes in the pH because enzymes are very, very specific. Okay, number three that we can't see, hashtag awesome sauce. You all got it right anyway. You said this was non-competitive inhibition. Why? You were right. Allosteric side. Yeah, it's not on the active side. Number four, the allosteric site often does involve feedback inhibition. What do people, if they missed it, they said is non -pro no. no. Enzymes are always protein. Excuses, excuses. She's saying she was trying so hard. Okay, here's another one. Oh, let me show you the questions so you can work on them. Here's question one. Here's question two. Pause it if you need to. And here's question three. Good job. Metabolism is all the enzyme-mediated reaction. ATP is used for all three types of work. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. A is right, but so is B, hydrolyzed. Remember, water comes in, snaps off a phosphate, and ATP can be coupled to an endergonic reaction. And I think, my friends, that, oh, here's one more you would like. Una mas. Would you like one more? Oh, Shay Shay. Spanish three on his <laughs> Three questions. Here you go. Question number one. Question two. Question three. You ready? Okay, here we go. The energy, okay, back here. If it's not 100% efficient, it's because every time it changes form, you lose some of heat. That's law two. Okay. Um, number, yay. Disorganization. Oh. Okay. And I 
<laughs> That's it. Yes, that is. Good job, you guys. I'm proud of you. Remember tomorrow, bring some maybe headphones. You're gonna, you could do your Ed Puzzle. Also, you're gonna be working on your water, right? Your water, what are you gonna do with the water? And you're gonna post them, because I think I'm presenting after lunch. Oh, oh for real? Yeah, yeah. It got postponed, yeah, so, after lunch. Okay, do a great job.